I've been very interested in using computers for uh, social interactions for quite a while. Actually, going back before that, I did the first 3D adventure game called The Colony. came out 1987-88 on the Macintosh. Uh, that led to uh, starting a company called Verse Corporation, did Verse walkthrough, real-time 3D design tool. Um, uh, later on, I co-founded uh, Red Storm Entertainment with Tom Clancy, where we did Rainbow Six. Uh, also, uh, started another game company with Michael Crichton called Timeline, which didn't do as well, but it was a very interesting experience. Um, uh, so, my background uh, has been a lot in 3D, but actually systems design. Uh, I, uh, 3D was sort of a way of expressing these ideas. But in particular, uh, I got very interested in the idea of using these kinds of environments for social interaction, collaboration, allowing users to uh, interact in a very deep way. I mean, obviously, uh, the idea of multiplayer computer games was part of that. But really looking at it as a basis of interaction in itself. Um, 1990, Alan Kay and I started this really long dialogue about the fact that innovation on the PC ha was, uh, was kind of dead. Now, this is six years after the Macintosh had come out in 1984. And when the Mac came out, I was just totally blown away. It was a, an amazing, amazing thing. Uh, and you know, you sort of see this wonderful arc of innovation coming from that, and it was sort of interesting. Six years later, it really hadn't gone anywhere. There are a couple of interesting applications, things like desktop publishing, things like, well, my game I thought was pretty interesting. Um, but uh, for the most part, you know, the infrastructure hadn't changed. Um, you look at Windows, you look at the Macintosh, then it was, uh, you know, not much different from what it had been six years earlier. Well, here is uh, 21 years later, and in fact, the only difference is you have color and you have ads. That's not sufficient. Well, so uh, Alan and I continued this dialogue over the years. Um, then three years ago, we um, decided to do something about it. I had sort of showed him the sort of the seeds of uh, what I could, what I thought of as a next generation collaboration environment. Uh, did a prototype in 1980, uh, 1994, and uh, uh, and, and so we had a pretty clear idea of what we wanted to do and how we wanted to do it. Uh, three years ago, uh, Alan and I decided to make it happen. So Alan introduced me to David Reed. Um, David's, uh, Alan calls him the slash in TCP IP. He's a guy who figured out to put TCP on top of IP instead of a separate protocol. He's also a co-inventor of what's called the end-to-end -end argument, which is the basis of the internet, which is the intelligent edges. Um, He's also chief scientist at Lotus for a while. And then uh, Andreas Robb, who is uh, Alan's right-hand man, developing uh, Squeak, which is uh, a, a wonderful development environment, which was kind of the direct descendant of Alan's work at, uh, at Xerox with Smalltalk. So we started the Croquet Project. And the idea there is a richly collaborative infrastructure. It is, imagine if you could build a new operating system from the ground up, knowing what we know today. We know we have this richly interconnected systems. We have very, we have broadband connectivity. We have really, really fast computers. Uh, we have a really rich uh, uh, framework, a rich environment within which to develop new ideas. Uh, so we said, let's restart. Let's rethink the whole thing from the ground up. And clearly, we've been talking about this idea of the computer is a vehicle for collaboration, but we really uh, uh, we honed in on that. That was just it's such a rich and interesting area. I mean, the most interesting thing in the world is another human being. Uh, you, know, you can write the best game in the world, but it's n it pales in comparison to social interaction. So if we can actually not only provide that social interaction, but perhaps even expand the scope of the interaction. In other words, looking at uh, the, the, the human's interaction, you have a very narrow channel. Certainly a computer is extraordinarily, extraordinarily narrow channel of communication, email. Maybe you've got video, but let's fr frankly, that's not very much. Even face-to-face, -face, we have something of a narrow channel. Whatever I can express to you uh, with my hands and my vocal, and maybe I can do a drawing for you, that's still pretty narrow. What if we could actually express 
even fairly sophisticated uh, simulations as part of the conversation. You actually say, okay, here's a, uh, uh, here's a factory floor, and I want to you know, actually watch it operate. And look, let me change this around uh, and actually see how that diverts the flow and see how that, you know, actually measure that. And you can say, well, you know, look what happens over here. So we're actually using the simulation as the basis of our conversation, but we're actually interacting with it, modifying it. So essentially it becomes part of the conversation, an integral part. So what we've just done is expanded the scope of our abilities to communicate ideas to deal with fairly complex things that we normally wouldn't be able to do. Well, that's what we're after. We're after this idea of expanding what we are. Uh, I think you're defined by the way, you, the nature of your ability to communicate more than anything. And if we can expand that, then we expand which is your definition. And so the Croquet Project is focused on that. Whether it succeeds or not, it's kind of irrelevant because it's intended to be primarily an existence proof that, in fact, you can have innovation on even today's PCs from the ground up. And further, it can demonstrate, I think, something that this, this rich, uh, high bandwidth collaboration actually does have value. So, uh, in a sense, what we're thinking, what we, what we believe is the internet, you know, this end-to-end this, uh, -end thing, is like we put people at those nodes, right? And uh, imagine a system that's always connected, you're always accessible, you're always able to access other people, you're also able to access this huge uh, framework of ideas, innovative innovations, uh, simulations. Uh, you can express new ones dynamically. Uh, we're looking at you know, how do, you know, it, it wouldn't be great if we could actually have a programming language that's expressed verbally where I can say something and actually have it happen. Uh, so essentially become, make the computer part of, uh, a, a true part of the expansion of my, my, my uh, communication abilities even at that level. Sort of like, a, remember Hy HyperCard. If we could actually turn HyperCard into sort of a, uh, you know, sort of this 3D v visual and vocal thing, you know, I, ex I, I express the, this HyperTalk and, and the computer responds. And I, I, so my, my communication is expanded by these really even abstract ideas. Um, so uh, that's, that's what we're after, and that's what we're building. And we've already made a fairly significant progress. I might add, by the way, it's sort of interesting, this whole experience taught me uh, something very important, is why was it that Alan's, Alan and his guys, and before that, Doug and Labart and his guys, were able to be so innovative. I mean, essentially they invented everything we think of and, uh, when we use a PC. When we look at the PC today, these are not new ideas. These are things that existed in the 70s, uh, worked extraordinarily well in the 70s, including communication between people, and they had Ethernet there, including object-oriented programming, uh, bitmap displays, uh, you know, overlapping windows, pop-up menus. Why is it they could do so much in such a short amount of time? And we've done so little in since. And the reason is, they had control all the way to the metal. They could, if they had an idea, they had no trouble being able to implement it because there were no barriers. There was nothing that said, you can't go below this, you can't go beyond this. There's nothing that stopped them. When Gates and Jobs saw what Alan had done, they said, we love that, this is beautiful, and it was. But they took those ideas and they cast them into amber. You know what I mean? They essentially said, we're gonna freeze this and so, such that developers, programmers, even users can't expand on it. All they can do is build on top. So they essentially said, this is the foundation of your building. And you can't change that. And that means also you can only build a certain kind of building. Right. So innovation occurred for a while after that because we saw desktop publishing, we saw all kinds of interesting things occur. But there was no deep innovation. Uh, nothing that would really uh, sort of transcend whatever it was they gave us in the first place. And we see that 21 years later, uh, essentially the PC is uh, considered to be dead. Ask any venture capitalist. If you're starting a software company to do uh, PC applications, they will laugh at you for right, for right good reasons. There is no growth business there. There's nothing new. Um, and I see that as a problem. The PC is not dead by any means, but this particular branch is. I mean, anything, uh, biologists say that anything that's not growing is dead. Well, PC business is not growing. It's dead. 
uh, killed for a lot of reasons, but mostly because of the need to control. Open source begins to get beyond that, uh, and I think it's, a, it, it's the seeds of uh, the next generation of innovation. But interestingly enough, the first really interesting open source projects happen to be throwbacks even before Windows and the Macintosh. Unix is not new. In fact, it's quite ancient. But at least it gives us a framework within which to start building new stuff on because we have access all the way through. Uh, what we're after here is a, something a little bit different where it is ground up, accessible, not just, I mean, I, unless you're an uh, extraordinary programmer, Linux is not accessible. You won't be able to dive into that thing and start modifying it. What if we could make a system where uh, you could actually go deep? Uh, Alan's original idea for objects was, in fact, uh, you know, these are little computers uh, in and of, of themselves. Uh, and uh, can be easily understood, easily manipulated. Uh, and being able to compose these simple things into more complex things, it's a very powerful idea, it's a very powerful way of building systems. Uh, and it turns out it's a, it's a way of developing very robust things. It sort of replicates the idea of the internet being a very simple thing that allows very complex things to emerge. Uh, what if we could build systems that way? Fact is we can and we should. That means everybody can actually contribute, anyone can contribute to some aspect of this at almost any level. Uh, and that is truly empowering. When, when I look at what this conference is about, for example, we talk about uh, intelligence amplification, but really what it is is leveraging the creativity of anyone to do anything uh, and removing barriers. And that's, uh, that's sort of what I see as the real opportunity of the net, and it's clear, and everybody I think gets that, is that it's unleashing uh, humans' abilities uh, to uh, be creative and expressive and do that in a social context. So that's the future. I mean, essentially, we will become very, very powerful uh, because we're going to be allowed to think and do things in and interact with things that we normally wouldn't be able to do. And I see a direct path to be able to achieve that. It's not like it's, it, this isn't uh, uh, like proselytizing or anything. It's just like, it's a fact. It can happen, it will happen. And uh, you know, it, it may be a slow process. Alan points out, it took 150 years from the invention of the printing press for it to really have any impact. Uh, we're hoping that it won't take that long this time around. You know, it was like the PC, uh, uh, it is having probably an impact certainly a lot sooner than the printing press did. Will it have the level of impact that it's going to? I think that may well take 150 years. But, uh, or if you think, believe in singularity, maybe it's 25. But nevertheless, it, it's, uh, it isn't here yet. Uh, but I, it's, it's coming. And it, it'll get here when, yeah, after things have been redesigned from the ground up again and again to, so that we're able to do different things? I don't know. Um, I, I think that's a necessary uh, piece of it where people have access and understandability of what's going on. Uh, is it sufficient? I don't know. I don't think so. But uh, and it, uh, that actually goes deep to the heart of what being a computer scientist means, what being a user means. People are not taught systems design today, for example, so people don't necessarily have an understanding of how to build interesting systems. Uh, you know, that means the software is going to have to lend a, a big hand in, in guiding that, um, which hasn't been done. Um, so I, 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 don't, I don't know how that will roll out, but I do know that when people have access to power, they use it. And uh, if you keep them away from it, they don't even know that it exists, right? So it was sort of telling when I, when I did one of the games we did, uh, you know, it's sort of like you have this divide, division of, of labor. You have the artists over here, you have the programmers over here, and then you have the designers over there. And one of the things that we found, once we built a system that was actually pretty easy to script, the artists started doing a lot of the scripting. They, they had this vision for, this is the way I want you to use the artwork, right? So what happens is they said, well, I can write a little piece of code because it's very accessible to me. And they did. And they got this wonderful effect, you know, that, that was the designers hadn't thought of it, the programmers hadn't thought of it. So essentially what they were doing was using this medium of code to express themselves artistically. Well, that's what you want, right? That's what you want. You'd be able to extend their vocabulary 
to include dynamic simulations, to include these really interesting interactions. And it was true, some of the program, or some of the artists didn't embrace that, but the ones that did uh, were able to sort of transcend uh, into something new, and it was uh, really beautiful to see. So that potential's there. And these are pro people who have never programmed before, right? What drove them? Um, it, it's sort of this desire, right? Uh, people will learn amazing things. Anybody who's played a computer game knows this, that you will spend days to figure something out. I mean, you will spend you know, orders of magnitude more effort on trying to solve a puzzle in a game than you would ever try to you know, solve a physics problem, right? Why is that? And it's like there's this desire there that sort of, you know, the, the game creates. Well, why can't we do that with every aspect of the technology? Why can't we make it so that, the, you know, this interaction that you have uh, with this stuff is, you know, more like the game? In fact, that is actually what occurs when you start looking at social interactions. You know, it's like, hey, I'm, I want to make something to show you. My, my, my uh, at the time, six-year-old, uh, got totally addicted to the stuff I'm doing, and the reason was he would build something and show it to me in the virtual environment. I'm in the same environment that he is, and we're looking at it, and it was just sort of, there's this really extraordinarily positive feedback loop between the two, right? I made something, I showed it, got really good reinforcement, wow, make another thing, make another thing, make a better thing. Uh, social pressures like that are extraordinarily powerful, and I think that that's exactly what could replace the kinds of interactions that a game creates you know, and, and drive people to really transcend what they would normally want to do and be able to do. So I, I'm very optimistic about all that. I think it's uh, going to be a very, very interesting time once we start unleashing, and it already has been, you know, the, doing web development, uh, anyone can do it. A, a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of people are really into that. Uh, Neopets was a good example where you know, teenage girls, young teenage girls, would uh, put up websites for their, for their little pets and it became very much a social thing. And it's like, and they, first of all, I learned from the other, their peers about how to do it. Oh, you got a really neat, a neat uh, result there. How did you do that? And so these, these kids learn very complex HTML very, very quickly because it was part of the peer pressure, part of that being part of the group. And because they, you know, it was this really neat free flow of information. Uh, so it can actually occur with or without something like what I'm doing, but what if a system was designed from the ground up to do that, be part of that? And uh, so that, that gets really interesting. So there you go. What do you think the future of gaming is? Uh, I, I think this idea of the mega movie type model is flawed. It doesn't scale. Uh, I mean, I, I, there may be always a role for it, but to be honest, I think that leveraging these little garage groups and then sort of the, the modders as part of that. And essentially, it, it, I, I think once you have enough of an infrastructure uh, that gives you a rich enough vocabulary to express yourself without depending upon the big game engines, uh, I, I think it, it's over for the big players. Uh, they won't be able to keep up. I mean, you got you know, they, they'll be able to deploy hundreds of people to build a game, right? That's a huge effort. Well, uh, the, the modders, if you can think of it, will be able to deploy hundreds of thousands of people. And you'll have these extraordinarily rich, interconnected environments that go on and on. It's sort of like the muds and the moos, uh, but with sort of a, a much richer vocabulary, much, uh, much broader scope. And it's going to be interesting, too. I think you're going to see a breaking down of barriers between you know, this is a game and this is an educational experience and this is uh, you know, a social environment. Uh, Second Life is demonstrating that to a certain degree. Uh, so I, I sort of see the gaming thing becoming, uh, in a sense, a lot more accessible for people to create an experience uh, becomes part of the social framework as opposed to a box that you buy. And I, I think that's really interesting. And uh, I, I expect you're going to see some really wonderful things come out of that. And as always, a lot of crap, but that's OK. You're really optimistic. Is there anything that worries you? Well, 
anytime you have uh, the unleashing of capabilities, you have a huge uh, rejection desire for retaining control, right? Uh, it, 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 in the end, all that can do is slow it down. It can't stop it. But, it, you know, it, it's uh, unfortunately the, those inefficiencies are part of the social framework, right? Is uh, these people who control a lot of the infrastructure, have a desire to continue to control it, and will do what they think is necessary to maintain that control. Um, uh, and, and I think that, that, that will, that's a necessary part of their existence, right? Because if they don't do that, they're going to go away. Uh, so they have to defend their turf. Uh, but you know, in the long term, socially, it's not valuable. It's a, it's just an impedance. It's a, it's friction, so that slows things down. Um, I think that seeing things like uh, governmental control of aspects of this is potentially dangerous, uh, well, extraordinarily dangerous. Right? I, I think that the internet represents one of the most powerful forces for democracy that might have ever existed. And of course, the same thing that I just said earlier applies to governments. You know, their turf is at risk. Uh, what happens then? Um, going further beyond that, I had this idea. When you talk about personal empowerment, right, we're taking this idea that anyone can do anything, right? So in a sense, you know, look out 20, 30 years, you're going to see a situation where everyone in the world has their personal red button that they can press and will destroy the world. I mean, it's sort of inevitable, right? I mean, I can make one almost, you know, not quite, but you can just see where everyone's going to have one. And if they can't, don't have one, they can make one. What's to prevent some guy from doing that? You know, there's a lot of crazy people out there. So that actually turns everything on its head, right, where we have this social freedom. We want that. We want to make sure that everybody can do whatever they want to. But as soon as that red button exists, then we have to watch everybody to make sure they don't press that button, right? That's worrisome. Both sides, right? On the one hand, you don't want that red button to be out in everybody's hands, and you don't want anybody to press it. On the other hand, you don't want people having to watch for the red button. Uh, so that's probably the that, well, as far as the internet's concerned, that's the that's my issue. It's like I think that's going to be a very interesting uh, problem. We already see it to a certain degree. You know, I, any good programmer, even the amateur program would create a virus that causes a lot of problems, right? I mean, you want to take down the power grid, it doesn't take that much effort. Uh, so that's a concern. That's a real concern. Well, we'll multiply that. Every time we get more powerful, we can do far more damage as, far, as well as far more good. Uh, and, uh, and I don't really have an answer to that one. I certainly don't want somebody looking over my shoulder to make sure I don't do something. That would be the worst situation almost rather somebody push the button. But uh, yeah, that's a, that, is, that is a real concern. Anything we haven't talked about that you think is important to know? Oh, I've talked too much, I think. Uh, there, there's, you know, the grand scope of, of existence, there's, the, the, the very beauty of it is that there's so many interesting things to think about, talk about, and do. So the answer is absolutely. I can go on forever about things I don't know about. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I, I think uh, overall, as I mentioned, uh, I'm extraordinarily optimistic about at least the reasonable short term. I, I think some wonderful things will be happening, in particular at the individual empowerment level. Uh, intelligent, they call it intelligence amplification, right? Uh, I think it's more than that. Um, yeah, I, I, I think this. You know, it were really defined, as I said, by, by these things. So our very definition is going to change. Uh, interesting, uh, we, we talked about the singularity at this conference. It's like, well, uh, to my grandparents, we're already there. They don't have a clue what I do. I mean, they, they couldn't understand any of this. It's all magic. You know, they're, we're already transcendent. Uh, my kids are going to be doing things that I don't understand. It's just the way it goes. It's, it's all point of view. Great. All right. Thank you. Sure.